Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. My name is Courtney Stone, and I'm the Animal Operations and Community Partnerships Manager at Annenberg Pet Space. Thank you so much for joining us for the return of our wellness workshop series, where we tackle practical everyday issues for pet parents with guidance from animal experts. Today, we're excited to welcome back our very own Katie McGuire, who is the Animal Behavior and Training Coordinator here at Pet Space. Katie performs behavior assessments and develops training plans for all of our adoptable animals. Additionally, she teaches our Mutt Manners training and agility classes, which are available to the public. We will begin with a presentation from Katie and we'll have time for a Q&A session afterwards. Please hold your questions until then. Before we, be we begin, please a quick reminder to check out your, our adoptable animals, upcoming programs and events at annenbergpetspace.org. Now I'm pleased to introduce Katie McGuire. She's an accomplished certified pet dog trainer with more than 13 years of experience. She previously worked as an onset safety representative with the American Humane Association, ensuring that animals were being treated humanely during film and television productions. She also launched her own dog training business. Katie competes with her own dogs in agility, confirmation, rally obedience, and competition obedience, earning many wins in competing at the national level. She joined Annenberg Pet Space in 2018, first as our Mutt Manners trainer, and in 2020 as our full-time trainer. Please join me in welcoming Katie. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Wonderful to be here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Yeah, I'm really excited about this topic. I think it's something that um, uh, that it needs to be explored more. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you want to get us started with your presentation? Yes, I do. All right. So let's go through all of the um, technicalities here. Make sure we get technology working on our side. Okay. Can you see it? Yep, we can see your screen. All right, good. Let's get started. So playful versus problematic dog behavior. Um, these two things can often look very similar. And that's why we're going to explore today um, the differences between the two and uh, what we can do about them, how we can deal with them. So um, we've got some uh, lovely screenshots of, uh, of play. Sometimes I will kind of intermittently ask whether you think what we're seeing up on the screen is play or problematic, um, or if it's play or aggressive because it can actually get quite confusing. So we're, do, we're gonna do a little bit of overview here. Um, what we're gonna cover today uh, is play behavior and specifically dog to dog play versus dog to human play, styles of play, what they are and what they look like, um, age factors. Um, and then when dogs' behaviors can get confusing, we can't really tell whether it's play or aggression. And that really is usually focused, at least um, when it's dogs and humans, it's really focused on mouthing, nipping, and biting. That tends to be where uh, we see the most confusion about whether we're seeing aggression or uh, play. Uh, causes for those behaviors, what we can do. And then we're going to touch on aggression in dogs, what it is and why it happens and how to tell the difference between play and aggression and what to do about it. So what is playful behavior? So this is an actual definition, which is where we're going to start of playful behavior. So play behavior includes running, pouncing, vocalizing, for example, growling and barking, wrestling, and often includes components of the predatory sequence, such as chasing, rolling around and biting. Play does not involve aggressive, play itself does not involve aggressive intent and can occur between animals of the same species, different species, with humans or with objects. So dogs can also just play with the toy on their own. And play borrows behaviors that are used in predation, conflict, and mating, including nipping, chasing, mounting, growling, tackling, and biting. And that is an important element that we want to uh, think about when we think about playful behavior, because all of those things, although play is not aggressive, all of those things are also things that we might see with aggression. And then we have um, this, which kind of shows an example of dog dog play with both running and chasing. And we've got some 
some mouthing and some tackling and some crazy jumping. <laughs> that is Odin and Atlas uh, just having a blast playing with each other. But I didn't put any sound in here. And it's interesting because when you don't have the sound, it actually takes a big part of the context away. And that's something that I want to, um, to really stress as we go on, because there's so much to this picture um, to be able to tell what's going on exactly. All right. So species appropriate play. So let's talk about dog dog play. Um, dog dog play is, it's a natural behavior that facilitates learning, especially in puppies. And dogs may also play before we even go into dog dog play, dogs may also play with other species. Um, they can play with many different types of species. You can find videos all over the internet of it. But in this seminar, we are going to focus on dog dog play and dog human play. Um, and then also on the other side of that um, with problematic behaviors. And dogs can also play by themselves. We're not going to focus as much on that either, but I do want to address that that is one of the play options. So natural behavior that facilitates learning uh, with dog dog play, what they're really learning for the most part, especially with puppies is appropriate social interactions, social relationships, conflict avoidance and diffusion and bite inhibition. Okay. Puppies learn how to appropriately interact with each other, develop and maintain social relationships and diffuse conflicts and control the intensity of their bite. And that's what the bite inhibition is. So with puppies, when they start to, um, to play with each other, they will bite down on each other. And then if it's too much, the other puppy will yelp. And that often will cause a startle response. Everybody will kind of stop and then they'll go back to playing. And those puppies just learned, well, the puppy who bit just learned that that was too hard and that they need to inhibit their bites so that they don't cause injury or pain because then the play is not fun, right? Play is not supposed to be uh, painful. It should be fun. And other kinds of dog dog uh, play would be with toys. Um, so that could be tug of war games where they tug on the same toy. Um, and this does happen, but they're more likely, dogs are more likely to playfully compete for possession of the toy with other dogs. Whereas when they're playing with humans, they're more likely to give up the toy in order to continue the game. So dogs do kind of um, have different play styles with humans as well. Um, and so that's something that is an interesting note. Um, and then also with toys, they do a lot of keep away and chase. And that's where one dog has a toy and parades it around the other dog to encourage chasing or tugging. And some dogs really prefer not to tug, but will use toys to facilitate chasing or initiate play. Um, so kind of grab a toy, go over to another dog and then run off with it and try to start a game. And then there's dog dog social play, which is without toys. And this play can occur between unfamiliar dogs, but longer and sustained play sessions are more likely to occur between dogs that are familiar with one another. So that's an important thing to remember because if we're going to dog parks and taking our dogs and meeting lots of other dogs, um, just because they do really long, great play sessions with one dog that they know doesn't mean that they're going to do that same thing with dogs that they don't know. Um, because, you know, they have to kind of build a relationship. That's part of what play is about. Familiar dogs will play with a specific set of rules and it is really specific to their relationship and they may change their play styles when playing with different dogs. So social play. Oh, sorry. Social play can also be called um, play fighting as it includes behaviors similar to real fights, but they are less intense. Um, and it almost kind of simulates conflict or fighting, but it is still playful, but it allows them to kind of establish relationships and learn how to handle um, potential conflicts as well. So now let's talk about dog human play. Because I think this is often um, where we can see some confusion. So let's 
there's different types of dog human play. Um, the most common, really, most people play with dogs with toys. And that's usually tug or fetch. And fetch is a very specific human dog game because dogs can't throw a toy for fetch, right? So with toy play, um, it has kind of been thought in the past that when playing tug, the human should always win the game. Otherwise, behavioral issues associated with dominance could occur. But research has actually shown that there's no evidence in the behaviors of the dogs. Um, sorry, there is no evidence that there is a difference in the behaviors of the dogs that never win versus those who are allowed to win. In fact, the dogs who win more tug of war games generally show an increase in playful behavior. So you don't need to worry about who is winning the game of tug. Just enjoy it. Have fun with your dog. As long as it's not getting too intense, um, it's a great game and it uh, facilitates bonding and creating a great relationship with your, with your pet. And then there is social play um, and that's really without toys. Um, and we kind of think of that usually as the kind of rough and tumble or wrestling, and that's physical close contact play. And then um, there are variations on that. Um, there is a, uh, a method of play called Playway Dogs by Amy Cook, PhD. And she has um, created this method of social play that revolves around personal social play with your dog. And it consists of a variety of specific ways to interact with your dog that facilitate social bonding and aid in training, especially with shy and fearful dogs. So that's another version of social play. It's usually without toys, but it's a way that you can really focus and bond with your dog. All right. So we're going to have some video examples. We're going to have a lot of video examples in this, actually. And this is one of my favorite um, dog dog play videos because it's just so precious. Now this would technically be considered the wrestling version of play, but it's very gentle. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. What? <laughs> Those two were so cute. That was also their first meeting and they played like that every time that they met each other. It was pretty adorable. Um, and then we've got a little example here of human and uh, dog play. Another toy. There it is. <laughs> So that's a little bit of playing tug with a toy. And I was actually working on drop it, which he didn't do right away. And that's okay. When he did drop it, we got our treat. Um, but that's one of the nice human uh, dog interactions with a toy that you can do with that tugging. And I would kind of drag the toy around, get him to chase it. She thought it was absolutely fantastic. Oh, there we go. Um, and then styles of play. So I kind of already touched on this, but really when we think of, um, especially dog, dog play, but it also transfers over to dog human play. Um, the styles that we see most are running and chasing and wrestling, or it can be also called rough and tumble. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you come here. Come here, you big baby. I know. <laughs> I was a baby. I do a lot of narration when the dogs are playing. And, and that's actually something that I find really important when it comes to uh, dog, dog social play. If you have a dog who is a little bit nervous or uncertain about what exactly they should be doing during an interaction with another dog, I give a lot of encouragement. I praise them and let them know when they have good interactions. And I also interrupt if the interactions are getting too intense or I see that one dog is 
uh, not as comfortable. And then we have an example of wrestling or rough and tumble play. And this is um, actually another kind of very gentle example. <laughs> oh, good. I know, right? So that is Odin and George Michael. And you can see that there's a very big size difference between these two dogs. And Odin, the big guy, he um, self-handicaps. He makes sure that he is not hurting George Michael by tackling him or biting down on him too hard. He's being um, very sensitive to the smaller dog's size and aware of that. Um, and that shows really nice social skills and they developed a lovely relationship. What's always funny is if we didn't have sound on or if we even watched this maybe in slow-mo, it might be a little bit confusing as to whether this is aggressive or playful. Even though they're so gentle with each other, there's lots of flashing teeth and leaning and pushing. And those are typical things that we see in play. And then uh, this is another example of running and chasing. Uh, this is my own puppy and a friend's puppy who are both herding dogs. And sometimes you'll see um, more chasing or herding behavior or nipping behavior with certain breeds like herding breeds. And um, this video just always makes me crack up. So I had to share this example of running and chasing. And I took the sound off because they're also barking pretty much nonstop the entire time that they're doing this loop-de-loop -loop around the dining room table. Um, and this actually goes on for a little bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there's lots and lots of different play styles that we might see. Um, we can also see tugging with a toy, as we mentioned before. And this is maybe the laziest game of tug that I've ever seen. Um, but <laughs> cute nonetheless. And um, what characters you guys are. These two dogs have a really great relationship. They actually live with each other. So they're very comfortable tugging. Sometimes it can be a point of contention for dogs who don't know each other that well because they may um, have conflict over the resource. But when they do know each other well or they don't have any um, concerns about needing to protect their toy, then they may engage in a game of tug. And then there's also social play without a toy. And so this is a little example of some social play with my own dog. And she does some vocalization, but she also does some mouthing. So I use that example because she is a particularly vocal dog when she plays. And it's easy to get a little bit confused there as to whether that is play or aggression. That is definitely play for her. And I know her very well and I am comfortable with that. And you can see she um, on several occasions grabbed my wrist with her mouth, but it was gentle and it was with bite inhibition. Um, and so it was still part of play. Not everyone is comfortable playing with their dog that way. And that's okay. I usually recommend having a toy involved because, um, your dog might not have a whole lot of bite inhibition, or you might not prefer to be mouthed, even if your dog is gentle and has bite inhibition with it. So that is mostly a personal preference. Um, but this is something that I, uh, will do with my own dog is something that um, uh, you can absolutely do if your dog is not showing aggressive behaviors. And um, this example is, uh, there's not as much mouthing in it, but it's still the same kind of um, social play without a toy. Mm -hmm. 
So I did a lot of really goofy things with him. I know it looks really, really funny. Um, but that was Watson, who I fostered for a bit. And he had um, some sensitivities about playing with toys. So I couldn't use toys with him um, in a way that he would be comfortable with. But I wanted to find a way to work with him on um, being social and bonding and having positive associations with me. So we did a lot of this kind of play, which he really, really liked. And it helped him feel much more comfortable about me and um, humans and play in general. And we actually have a nice little um, graphic on playing with your dog. This is a Lily Chen illustration, and it gives examples of different things that you can do. One on one games like chase um, and then toy games. Right. And then also food games and noise games, um, sorry, nose games that you can play with your dog um, or you can have your dog play on their own. And then, of course, training is really a game. If you're doing it with positive reinforcement, and you're having fun. A lot of times that in and of itself is a game. Um, and then I also wanted to touch on dog body language as we start to move forward here. Because what we're looking for in differentiating between play and problematic behaviors is really the dog's body language. That's our first sign um, as to what it is that is going on uh, with the dog, whether we should be worried or if we are okay with what's going on. And the top ones here, so a happy dog, those are the ones that we want to see. A worried dog is somewhere in the middle. And then a threatening dog down at the bottom, those are the ones that we really should be concerned about. And these illustrations are so lovely because they give you a really good idea of some things that we might not always think about, right? So a worried dog, slightly cowering, whale eye, which is where you can see the whites of the eyes, yawning or scratching, or even doing things like licking lips or shaking off. We don't often see those things as signs that our dog might be uncomfortable. But if you're trying to play with your dog or another dog is trying to play with your dog, or maybe you're just trying to interact or do something with your dog and they do things like yawning, lip licking, or scratching when they're not itchy, they might actually be telling you that they're a little bit uncomfortable. And this could be very much a precursor to a more threatening behavior or a more problematic behavior. So being able to recognize those ones in the middle, the worried dog behavior or dog body language, those are the ones that we want to acknowledge before we get to the point where we actually see problematic behaviors. All right, we're gonna go into what to expect at what ages. Um, I do want to uh, briefly touch on the styles of play. Um, it is important that we see role reversal with the dogs. So for example, when we're seeing running and chasing that we were watching before, um, it's important that the dogs take turns and we don't always have one dog getting chased and maybe getting overwhelmed. And with the wrestling and the body slamming stuff, um, dogs really use their body language that we were just looking at in that slide to indicate that they are playing rather than expressing more serious behaviors like aggression, play bows, and some other things that we'll actually explore a little bit, um, help them to communicate that that's what's going on. All right, so now let's talk about what to expect at what ages. Play style and behavior changes with age. Mouthing, nipping, and biting can happen at any age, but it's most intense during teething and adolescence. So I think that these points in time, teething and adolescence in a dog's life, 
are the most common times where people become concerned about whether or not their dog is showing aggressive tendencies. And um, this is because the dogs get very, very mouthy around those times, right? And the nipping and the biting begins and it can get really intense and really excited and sometimes really vocal. And it is hard sometimes to know exactly what's going on. So let's start with um, the influential periods in social behavior. The primary socialization period, which is three to 12 weeks, um, that's early socialization. And that's when puppies begin to play with their litter mates. Uh, young puppies at this time are more likely to force each other to the ground and stand over one another than older dogs whose play style eventually changes. Puppies explore the world with their mouths, and so they tend to be very mouthy and need to be taught how to appropriately play with humans. No teeth to skin contact is really important um, because really, even though they're not in teething yet in this period, they still do everything with their mouths. They pick up everything in their mouths. It's how they play with their litter mates. It is completely normal and natural for them to use their mouths for everything. So it's really important that right away, we start to teach them that we don't want them to mouth and nip us when they interact with us. And the way that there are a few ways that we like to do that. One, with puppies, a lot of the time, in fact, most of the time, I have a toy with me when I'm just interacting with puppy. If I'm playing with the puppy, I'm probably, I am going to have a toy. In fact, I always recommend it. Have a toy when you're playing with a young puppy so that you can encourage them to bite on that toy because they're going to want to bite on something. It's so natural. It's so normal. And giving them that toy option allows them to have something that they can bite on that is not your skin or your clothing. And if they do bite you during play, yelp, just like another puppy would that I described before, and freeze. So exactly what the puppy would do if um, they were bitten too hard by their litter mate, right? They would yelp and stop. Everyone would take a moment and then play would probably go on or maybe they'd go off and do something else. But that's really the best way for us to teach our very young puppies exactly what we want them to do. We do the same thing. I do a big yelp and it surprises them. We stop, we wait for them to settle for a moment and then we return to playing and make sure you have a toy so that they have something to put their mouth on appropriately. Um, then after that early socialization period, we have puppyhood and teething, 12 weeks to six months. So um, we're really, the, the teething period is uh, four to six months. During the juvenile period, playful behavior with other dogs is really common. So um, between 12 weeks and six months, our puppies are very playful, right? So that's our puppyhood juvenile period. And that's usually when they'll kind of play with any puppies, as long as they've had nice positive associations with it, they just kind of go, oh my gosh, it's another puppy or another dog. This is great. Let's play. Um, and then when teething begins around four months, so between four and six months, the puppy's teeth are coming in and it's really uncomfortable. And they will often try to soothe that discomfort by chewing on things. At this stage, we most often see inappropriate chewing, but mouthing and nipping can also occur. So when that happens, during teething, you want to redirect your puppy to a toy or a chew. So um, if it's during play and they're being extra mouthy with you, you want to give them a toy to play with instead of your skin or clothing, just like we did during that earlier socialization period. But it might not just be that um, they're wanting to play and they're inappropriately putting their mouth on you. It could actually be that they really need to chew because a tooth is coming in or they're losing a tooth. And so in that case, you'd want to give them an appropriate flavored chew toy to help them kind of work it out. And there are some that you can actually soak in water or chicken broth and freeze. And it is very helpful because it allows them to just kind of soothe those gums. So don't get upset with your puppy. If they are in that teething um, phase of four to six months, they're 
having some discomfort. They are painful and they need some help. So it's not that they are trying to go after you necessarily. <laughs> there are, there are times, but most of the time, if it's just teething and mouthing, they are just um, having some discomfort. We need to help them out a little bit. And then we have adolescence, which is really six to 18 months. And that is our dog's peak energy level. Adolescence is another age where we see an increase in mouthing, nipping, and biting. And it's usually due to that high level of energy and a hormonal influx. Dogs between the ages of six to 18 months and sometimes older are at the peak of their energy level. And really, uh, they're like a human teenager. They have all the energy in the world to expend and just run around and do everything. Um, and a lot of times they will kind of forget their earlier training. And it can be really rough as a dog owner, dog parent at that time, um, because they get mouthy, they get tense, they're high energy, um, but it's normal. So at this age, it is really best to manage your dog's environment to prevent them from practicing these unwanted behaviors and give them structured, positive reinforcement training sessions to teach them what you want them to do. And hang in there. It does pass. This period is difficult and often owners feel confused and helpless when their perfect puppy has now seemingly forgotten all of their training. This is normal and it will pass, but it's important to continue managing and training during this time so that none of these adolescent behaviors become habits that they carry into adulthood. That is the, the primary thing that you want to think about during adolescence is Yes, that energy level will pass. Those, those naughty behaviors will probably subside, but you do want to manage your dog and continue training at that time, because if not, some of those behaviors can become habitual. Um, and then we have two to three years, which is really where we start to hit social maturity. And some dogs at this time will play less with other dogs or they become more dog selective. Um, and the onset of some types of regression also coincide with sexual maturity or social maturity. So this is where um, you start to see dogs um, being a little bit more choosy about their playmates with other dogs. And I often hear, oh, he used to play with everybody. And now we, you know, he didn't like this one dog or he had an altercation. And that is actually kind of normal. Sometimes what we do is we just start to pull back the amount of dogs that my dog is interacting with and instead have them just play with the ones that we know that they like um, so that we always have good experiences. And by the way, this is kind of similar with humans because kids tend to kind of play with all of the other kids at the playground. And then as we get older, we might get a little bit pickier about the people that we want to spend time with. <laughs> oh. And here we have an example of <laughs> wild puppy behavior. <laughs> that includes lots of he's just mouthing. having a zoomy moment. Oh no! Hi, Babush. <laughs> <laughs> yep, typical puppy behavior. <laughs> I just love that picture. So that picture is that playful or aggressive? This is one of the things that I really like to explore because it's difficult to tell. Now, what that picture actually is is her barking, right? So it's, it's not playful. Well, it is playful, but it's not aggressive. Um, but that was just a bark and it looks so dangerous. So these behaviors can get confusing. So that's what we're going to talk about next. This is the fun part. When dogs' behaviors get confused and mouthing, nipping, and biting. So why does my dog mouth and nip and bite? And we're going to talk about um, multiple different possibilities. Um, it can be really difficult to distinguish between playful behaviors versus problematic or more serious ones. So possible reasons could be that your dog is attempting to play with you or to get your attention. And there may be ma um, many reasons in general, um, but context is gonna be important as well as we go forward, context and environment. Um, they could be, experiencing over arousal or excitement. And then we've got the line where we've got these, these top two reasons are really much more on the, on the playful end of the spectrum. And then we get into my dog might be mouthing, nipping or biting 
because of fear, because they're afraid of something, because they're in pain or discomfort, um, because there is a conflict. They could be guarding something and it could be redirection. And this does not cover all of the possible reasons why these behaviors might be happening, but these are the primary ones. And this is really what we're going to look at. So when we're talking about um, the possibility of my dog is attempting to play with me or to get my attention, pushy mouthy, sorry, pushy mouthing or nipping can sometimes occur when the dog is attempting to initiate or continue play and not understanding the human's cues that play is not wanted. I think this is probably one of the most common versions of mouthing, nipping, and biting that I see in young dogs. It is not as common in older dogs, but remember that that adolescence period often can last to 18 months and for some dogs even longer. And this is something that we tend to see a lot in adolescence. Um, so it's especially common, as I said, in adolescence, it's especially common in young dogs who have not yet learned how humans communicate. So what can happen is my young dog is attempting to play with me, right? They come up and they grab my pant legs and they start pulling on my pants. And in order to um, try and alleviate that problem, I do things like push them away or tell them to stop. And my dog does not yet understand that what I am doing is a sign of discomfort rather than a, an attempt at playing as well, because it kind of looks like the wrestling and the rough and tumble play style, right? Um, so we have to help our dogs a little bit in, to understand that we don't want to play in those moments. So coming up and biting and nipping uh, is a normal way for dogs to initiate play. In fact, if you watch two dogs uh, attempt to play with one another, one might go over and start to mouth the other one. And if you try to punish the dog, as I said before, it could be actually interpreted as play. That pushing looks like the rough and tumble play style. And when they grab our clothes and pull on them, it is really a great tug toy. Um, and this is a <laughs> lovely, lovely video before I go on to the next part of, um, my dog is a puppy and I apologize for the camera work. I was trying to, um, take a video of this behavior, uh, but it was very difficult to video because she ran up and grabbed my pants. And so that's why this is the video that we're watching. I hope everyone appreciates this. And she was a big vocalizer too. Now, I was trying to get her to grab the toy. I, it was pretty, it actually went on for a long time, but it's, it's terrible camera work. But I wanted to give you the idea of exactly what that was. Because she saw me, wanted to play with me, and ran up and grabbed the bottom of my pant leg as a tug tool. And my response to that was to work on getting her onto a different toy because I had invited her to play. Um, but she really struggled for a long time with that. And her behavior looks almost aggressive, even though she's a little puppy. It has a lot of growling and vocalization to it. And it's very intense. And she kept coming back. But it was all an attempt to play, even though it was intense and loud. You might not have been able to tell in that video, but it was generally intense and loud. So what can you do if your dog is attempting to play with you um, by mouthing, nipping, and biting? So you want to always use a toy when playing, especially with young puppies. Um, if the puppy is going for your hands or clothing, uh, instead, you want to gently remove them and redirect them to an appropriate toy. So we talked before about social play without, without toys, and that is perfectly acceptable. But I like to use toys always for our dogs that are, um, or sorry, our puppies that are younger and making sure that I have a toy in case my dog or puppy doesn't really understand bite inhibition yet. 
the social play that we that I showed the couple videos of, you can only do if you have, um, if you're sure that your dog has some bite inhibition and if you um, are not really in the teething phase, because that's a really difficult point for our puppies to understand bite inhibition. Um, and you also want to be the one who initiates play. Don't start playing with your dog if they are mouthing or nipping you. So if they out of nowhere come up and start to mouth or nip at you and you then continue and start a game with them, they are going to continue that behavior in the future and they're likely to become more intense about it. Responding to that mouthing and nipping by playing with them will only encourage them to do it more. So you want to start a play, a play session when you want to. And choose a time when your dog is doing a behavior that you like so that they are more likely to do that behavior again in the future. So for instance, if your dog comes up and sits nicely and looks you in the eye, that's a great time to go, hey, let's go get a toy and play a little. But if your dog comes up to you and starts mouthing you and nipping at you, and then you begin a play session, they will do that in the future in order to start a play session. And then if they come up unwanted and start to mouth or nip you, you can take your attention away from the dog. Or even if you are already in a play session, um, you can immediately stop the play session if they are using their mouth on you in a way that is too harsh or if you don't want them to use their mouth on you at all. Just like we talked about, dogs will figure out um, proper play styles with a specific uh, play partner that they have, they do the same thing with humans. So if you don't want your dog to ever put their mouth on you at all, then you have to set up that rule and let your dog know that the game will not continue if they put their mouth on you. Okay. Um, and if uh, they continue to jump or mouth at you, um, you want to actually uh, turn away, cross your arms, and don't look at them or talk to them. That's how you want to take your attention away, right? So they put their mouth on you. You turn away, cross your arms, don't look at or talk to them. If they continue, if they start jumping up and grabbing at you, remove yourself from the room. Put yourself on the other side of a door or gate. You have to remove your attention. You have to remove the possibility of play if they're being pushy in this way. And then when they calm down, you can bring your attention back to them. All right, so over arousal. So we're going to start with the definition of arousal, which is an individual's general state of excitability or stimulation. This term is typically used when an animal is experiencing a heightened emotional and physiological state in which the brain is preparing the body to respond to a threat or an opportunity. High levels of emotional arousal can result in behaviors such as excitedly jumping or using their mouth on people or animals barking, whining, and more. Arousal affects the dog's ability to think clearly and function cognitively, often resulting in unwanted behavior. Arousal or overarousal is often triggered by something. Sorry. And um, it is like play behavior, but it is more intense. I think that very often when we are um, uncertain, about whether our behaviors are playful or problematic, that's because there's an element of overarousal to them. This is um, very difficult because it often is linked to also being very, very pushy. So some of the triggers <clears throat> that can happen, for example, let's say you are going to go for a walk or when you're coming back from one, um, play becoming too intense or exciting is often a trigger for overarousal seeing other dogs on walks, a squirrel in the backyard, or just because it's that time of night where it's the witching hour when your dog always seems to have a sudden explosion of energy and starts zooming around the yard or the living room. Um, and that one is most common in puppies and young dogs. And that uh, zooming around that they do and that overexcitement has an element of overarousal to it. And it will often include running up and mouthing and nipping you. Um, it is still within the realm of play, but it also has a heightened state of arousal, um, making it all a bit more intense and more difficult. And um, 
we still want to address the fact that dogs use their mouths for many things because after all, they don't have hands. And so when a dog becomes excited or overly aroused, they will often use their mouth as they would in play, even if play is not invited at the moment. With over arousal, these play behaviors can become much more intense and also vocalizations increase, right? They become louder and a little bit more excited. Um, and this, you know, if you want an idea of, of what this looks like, I think it's often common for this to happen when you go to get your leash or your dog's leash for a walk and they start to get really excited and they might bite, start biting at the leash or even at your feet, your ankles or your clothing. Um, over arousal, a lot of dogs like to grab hair for some reason. That's an exciting thing. Um, and, and this can be really, really frustrating and also feel a little bit aggressive, but it's really linked to excitement more than anything else. So what can we do about it? You want to stop the game. Uh, kind of similarly to the other play mouthing and nipping behaviors that we were talking about. So we want to stop the game. Now, you might not think you're playing a game but your dog does, right? So whatever it is that you're doing at that point, you want to stop. You want to stop any interactions with your dog. Uh, you want to get the point across that you do not want to play. And remember that dogs often vocalize during play. They often get very vocal during over arousal as well. So yelling at them to stop won't help. They will probably think that you are barking with them and having a whole lot of fun. So. That is not the answer. You want to just, again, stop the game. And then if possible, if they start, if they continue, if possible, you want to remove yourself, put yourself on the other side of a door or gate so that you don't get nipped, nipped and mouthed and that you also communicate exactly what it is. So we do have a video example. And what I want you to notice in this video example is that when the mouthing stops, the handler relaxes the leash because the mouthing is on the leash in this video and the handler relaxes the leash so that it's no longer exciting. If she were to pull up on it or pull back on it, then it would become a tug toy and she would be part of this game. So um, what I want you to watch what she does because it's, it's quite skilled. Yeah. yeah. So just a little bit of an example of over arousal there, right? It wasn't super, super over the top. You may see much more dramatic examples than, than that, but that was over arousal, right? So yes, it was a game, but it was, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. We're going out. I'm going to grab the leash and I'm going to pull on it. And then when that wasn't fun, all right, I guess I'll go do something else. And then she jumped up and that didn't get a response. All right, I guess I'll do something else. And that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to say, well, that's not going to get you anything you want right now. Let's try something else. All right. So aggression in dogs, what it is and why it happens. Again, with the definitions. Um, aggression is a normal form of communication that encompasses a variety of behaviors, ranging from warnings, like a growl, to an attack, which is, could include a bite. Aggressive behavior is almost always a distance-increasing behavior, meaning its intention is to create distance between the dog and the target for the behavior. Now, I do think it's really important to stress that it is within the range of normal behavior for dogs to show aggression. We want to teach them that we don't want them to be showing aggression inappropriately. And in general, we like to um, not have much aggression in our dogs at all, but it is still within a normal range of behavior. So defensive aggression is when a dog is fearful or anxious and would prefer to move away from a threatening stimulus, but feels unable to and responds to the stimulus with aggressive behavior. This aggressive behavior can look like growling, snapping, or biting in response to the stimulus entering their space and is often associated with fearful body language. So you can see this little illustration that shows the kind of uh, hallmark signs of defensive aggression. So you can see that this dog is has his weight shifted back 
And although he's trying to show that he is threatening, um, he is not attempting to move forward. He will, if, if you come into his space, it is very possible that these warnings uh, could be pushed to the point of a bite or an aggressive action. But that's why if you experience a dog like this, where they're showing that kind of defensive um, aggression, you want to back off. You don't want to continue to push into their space. You want to respect the fact that they are showing you that they are uncomfortable and figure out something different to do that doesn't push them to the point of um, having to respond with the next step of aggressive action. One of the things that I always say is if a dog growls at me, I thank them because they've just given me information without causing me any injury, right? The dog growls at me, they're telling me they don't like what I'm doing or they need space, but they are uncomfortable. And that communication allows me to avoid getting bit. And then I can take a step back from that situation and figure out a better way to address it in the future so that we don't end up um, making the dog uncomfortable in that way. And sometimes that might be that we're going to do some desensitization and counter conditioning, teaching the dog how to um, handle uh, whatever that interaction was in a better way. Um, and sometimes it could just be situational or context. If the dog is cornered or uncomfortable um, or in a new situation, there'd be a lot of different factors. And then there's offensive aggression. And this is when a dog moves towards and displays aggressive behavior toward a stimulus, for example, a person or another animal, instead of, instead of choosing to move away or disengage. This aggressive behavior can look like growling, lunging, snapping, or biting the stimulus. And you can see that the body posture in this illustration is very different, right? This dog wants to move forward. And offensive aggression is one where the dog will move towards the thing that they are aggressing towards. Um, and so this is something we definitely, you really want to avoid this one. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about going towards them at all because they're probably going to come towards you. But this is actually much less common than defensive aggression. And then we have redirected aggression. And redirected aggression uh, is aggression that occurs as a reaction to a stimulus that could result in a bite to a human or another animal nearby, grabbing their leash um, or grabbing a toy and sometimes shaking the toy. This is typically seen when the animal is unable to access their desired target, such as when another animal is on the other side of a barrier and there's a buildup of frustration and excitement. So um, I chose this image because I think of redirected aggression as someone punching a wall. They are not mad at the wall, right? But they're mad about something. And so they take their aggression out on the wall when they punch it. And that's what redirected aggression is. So a lot of times what you'll see is, you know, uh, a dog sees another dog and they might be reactive towards that other dog. They might bark and lunge, but they can't actually get to the other dog. So maybe they turn around and bite the leash or they turn around, they bite your calf or your pant leg. Um, it's not that they're actually mad at the leash and they're not mad at you but they are upset about that stimulus over there, but they can't get to that stimulus. So they're biting what is nearby. And this can also be very much linked to over arousal as well. So how to tell the difference between play and aggression? Um, with play, in most cases, a playful dog will have a relaxed body and face. Their body should be relaxed and flexible with a curve in the spine. Their muzzle might look wrinkled, but without much tension in the facial muscles. And um, playful mouthing is usually less painful than more serious aggressive biting, which is why when we do social play without toys, you know, you could see my dog mouthing me and it was part of play. And with aggression, the dog's body will look stiff and rigid with a very straight spine. They may wrinkle their muzzle and curl their lips upward to expose their teeth. Um, you might see freezing and hard staring or a fixed gaze. 
louder or lower vocalizations, like a low rumbling growl. <clears throat> and serious aggressive bites are usually quicker and more painful than those delivered during play. Um, and really, I'm going to show some video examples because you can't determine a dog's feelings or intentions by looking at only one body part. You need to look at the whole dog to get a complete picture of what's happening. And a lot of times you need to kind of learn about that individual too. Um, and although play and aggression are clearly different, the motor patterns and behaviors are very similar, making the two very similar looking and closely linked in many ways. Play and aggression can look so similar that um, slow motion footage of dogs playing is often used in movies and television when they're trying to depict dogs fighting. And because, um, because they're so linked and they have the same kind of motor patterns, um, over arousal can sometimes tip over into aggression and play can sometimes escalate to the point where it tips over to aggression. So there are times uh, when you may actually see uh, it shift from one to another. And so now I've got my uh, playful or aggressive videos. Again, this is my dog. And we talked about the different signs of aggression. And she is stiff and she is staring at me and she has frozen. But I know her. And I know how she likes to play. And one of the things that she likes to do is she likes to uh, playfully stalk, right? Like she's stalking a, a, a prey, a prey animal. Um, and that is part of what she's doing here. Even though it could be a little bit confusing if you don't know her. But notice she's not coming towards me. I'm actually moving towards her. And she isn't choosing to back off. <laughs> and um and this is part of her play now watch her tail yeah there's the leg. yeah <laughs> right ah, good girl um all right here's another one this is a very short one so that was very mild but he had a little snap and that was an air snap. He did not attempt to bite me, right? He wasn't saying, I want to bite your hand. He was saying, I want your hand to go away. I gave it a little air snap. And so what I learned in that moment with him was he didn't want me to touch his paws. We had some more work to do in order to get to the point where he was comfortable enough to touch his paws. Um, and this is probably my favorite one um, because it's, I took, I think I took the volume out. Let's take the volume out because it's slow-mo. This is slow-mo and watching um, this in slow-mo, it looks pretty intense <laughs> and pretty wild. Um, but this is definitely play behavior. But watch here as they turn around, you'll see some super flashing teeth. Yeah, there they are. And I mean, yes, these dogs are tiny, but it can really <laughs> be pretty intense um, when you slow down and see, look at that bite on the side there. Uh, when you slow down and see what's happening during play, um, there can be a lot of intensity in this. And it's just adorable because they're just so cool. Um, and then I also wanted to share um, the bite scales. So this is uh, kind of how we determine different kinds of bites. And really, if you look at level one and level two, these are free bite and near bite, right? Um, and I won't spend a whole lot of time going through all of these. So we're almost at the hour anyways, but there are different levels to um, different types of bites. And we, we look at these um, as the level of seriousness when we are talking about bites. I do want to note that in play, you know, we're talking about all of these bites are, are aggressive bites in this example, but in play, you can sometimes have bruising or scrapes happen when uh, dogs are using their mouths um, that are entirely playful and not aggressive. So just because 
they use their mouth um, and maybe accidentally a little bit too harshly or a, a nail snags, that doesn't always mean that it is aggression. Um, and so after you kind of learn all about the body language that we were talking about and how to um, determine a little bit better what um, all of these things look like, what should you do if you know or suspect that your dog is showing aggressive behaviors? You really want to try to avoid the triggers for those aggressive behaviors and find ways to manage them. And you want to make sure not to punish the behavior because this could actually cause more aggression. Um, depending on the reason and type of aggression, uh, punishment could cause more conflict, right? So if the dog is uncomfortable and then you aggress back towards them, because that's actually what it is, or try to punish them then they may feel like the only move that they have at that point is to get more aggressive, right? So you want to avoid that. And if you are really dealing with aggressive behaviors, um, you want to find a professional certified dog behavior consultant or a certified trainer with behavior experience, um, or you want to talk to a veterinary behaviorist or, um, well, there are a couple of other kinds of behaviorists as well, but a veterinary behaviorist is going to be, especially if you're dealing with severe aggression, um, the most qualified person to talk to. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Katie. I learned so much and so much insight on uh, my both of my own dogs and their oh. different play styles. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you for everyone who is um, still here with us. Um, we're going to open up for some questions. Um, so feel free if you have a question to either put it in the Q&A uh, function or also in the uh, chat function. And we will go ahead and take a couple questions. I know that we did have one question. Let me just pull them up. Uh, one question about um, what was the name of the book or the course that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation regarding teaching shy dogs to play? Oh, um, that is called Playway Dogs uh, by Amy Cook. Um, it's not, it is not a book. It is, it is a program, a methodology that she uses. Um, she teaches seminars and she does uh, private training as well. Um, and she actually uses, it's a very interesting program because she uses, um, she studied many different dog trainers and how they played and interacted with their dogs. And then she also studied play therapy with human children. And she integrated um, pieces of both of that because Play is such an important part of the social dynamic between dogs, but also between humans and dogs. They actually um, have done some research where they really think that the reason we see dogs playing as adults, which is a very rare thing in the animal kingdom. Oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> um, but they think that the, part of the reason why we see that is it may be a side effect of um, selective reading for dogs to be more, um, amiable and trainable with us, uh, and easier to, um, to have those relationships with, um, that might actually be why we see play behavior so much longer in dogs as adults. Right. Um, yeah, so we've got a couple questions about um, similar topics about if you have a dog that is, uh, you know, intense and relentlessly playing and not taking cues from other dogs who don't want to play. Uh, how should you go about handling those situations? Yeah, so that's where I would remove them from the situation. I wouldn't let that go on. And it is actually pretty common for uh, puppies or even young adolescent dogs to be far pushier than their adult counterparts. Um, you know, it's kind of how we went through uh, the different age factors and how that affects uh, these behaviors. When we see adult dogs, they often don't want to play as much or as intensely or with as many different dogs as the younger ones. So I try to give older dogs a break by um, taking the younger dogs who are pestering them about playing so much away and giving them some downtime. I really manage that a lot. Uh, so if, if I, if this is within the same household, so I've got an older dog and a younger dog, 
I actually keep them separated quite a bit and then supervise play sessions, observe my older dog um, to make sure that they are comfortable with the play and enjoying it. And if they're not, I will actually take the younger dog away and maybe work on some stuff with them separately. So I might actually have them in an X pen or a crate, or I may just put them on leash and have them hang out with me, maybe teach them down on a mat so that they learn how to be calm around that older dog rather than just constantly pushing them to play. Fantastic. Um, so have a couple others about um, if you would recommend using a muzzle so that a dog can safely sniff another dog or uh, could join in uh, dog park play um, so that you could be 100% sure that uh, there won't be any aggression. Um, apparently the dog looks like she wants to sniff, but will change on a dime and to start snarling. How would you handle that situation? Ooh, that is a tough one. There's a lot of factors there. Um, I will use muzzles with dogs who are um, getting to the point where they want to socialize, but they still have moments where they're unsure. Um, that's when I would use a, a muzzle. But I wouldn't take a dog that has shown... Um, just blatant aggression or blatant discomfort or fear. I wouldn't put a muzzle on them and then put them in a situation with other dogs. Um, in that description, if I had a dog that I wasn't a hundred percent sure was going to be super social with other dogs, I wouldn't take them to a dog park. I would probably talk with a trainer who has the ability to have my dog interact with some other dogs first. And I would practice um, with dogs who I know are really, really solid and get an idea for how my dog is going to safely interact and maybe which dogs they like. It could very well be, especially in the description of turning on a dime, it might be that that dog is actually just selective. And that dog doesn't like to go to the dog park because she can't really select her playmates. She has to play with whoever approaches her and her corrections of saying, I need space are overblown, which could be, well, they might not be overblown. If it is just a snarl, then that's a very appropriate way to say that she needs space. But we don't know that the other dogs at the dog park understand that or are going to listen to her. Um, I want to always be cautious that I would not want to put my dog in a situation where they are uncomfortable and take away their ability to, to communicate that. So if my dog is snarling when dogs approach her because she says, I don't want them to approach me and I would like to communicate with them to back off. And if they don't, then she may escalate to the next level, which would, could be a snapper, could be a bite, it could be many things. We don't want her to feel like she's got to escalate. If I see my dog snarling or getting uncomfortable, then I want to remove them from that situation and observe that whatever was happening in that situation is something that she does not enjoy. Okay, I think we've got quite a few more questions, but I think we've got time to answer maybe two more. And for anyone whose questions we uh, aren't able to get to today, please feel free to email us. Um, and we can put uh, an email link uh, in the chat and we'd be happy to answer your questions um, you know, later because we wanna make sure we get to everybody's questions. So we have one about any tips for socializing an adolescent dog who did not have the proper puppy socialization and is very shy and timid. Yeah, so with shy and timid dogs, especially young or adolescent dogs, go slow. Everything should be really, really minimal. Um, what I like to do is if I've got an adolescent dog, especially who didn't get a lot of play when they were younger, um, I take them to places where I know the other dogs are going to be controlled. So that could be a group training class. And it depends on the fear, um, that your dog is showing. If they, if they're terrified of even the sight of another dog, then you might need to go, uh, even easier, but usually a group class where you know everyone is on leash and under control is a nice way to start that. They don't need to go and interact with other dogs to start their socialization process. In fact, what you want to see is that they are able to be around other dogs and be comfortable. And they also learn with that to trust you 
that you're not going to let those dogs come up to them and scare them, that being out in the world with you is safe and that they're not going to experience anything um, that would make them uncomfortable. And then what you can do is you can gradually start to get closer to those other dogs. You can um, potentially find a dog who's really mellow and very um, friendly with other dogs, but calm and gradually start to work with that dog or those types of dogs. What you don't want to do is put your dog into some sort of a play group situation where they become overwhelmed because that could take your dog from being fearful to being um, defensively aggressive. And that can build up if they learn that it works, which it does, right? Because if my dog is fearful, dogs come up to them, they don't know what to do. They become aggressive in that moment. The dogs back off and they go, oh, well, that works. So now in the future, I now have a reactive, outwardly aggressive dog because they know that it keeps those dogs away. So go slow make it really controlled and really easy, and then do lots and lots of praise and treats and tell your dog that they're absolutely phenomenal for just being around other dogs because you know it's scary. It can be. You don't know what those other dogs are going to do. I get it. All right. Fantastic. So last question. Um, What would you do or how should you address the behavior if you have a dog that sometimes gets possessive of their toys and growls at their other dog playmates? So this is a really interesting question because, and I'm, I am going to take your word for it, that the growl is aggressive because as we know, it could actually be playful or aggressive, but I believe that you probably know what is going on with your dog. And it probably is, um, a little bit of guarding behavior. So there are a lot of different pieces to this, but, um, Suffice to say that in dog world, if it is in your mouth or between your paws, it is yours and no one should come up and take it. Some dogs are very good at sharing. And so they will um, not mind if another dog comes up and shares. But toy play with dogs, as I said earlier, is actually, um, it's common in young dogs, but it gets much less common in older dogs. They think of toys um, much more as possessions. So I do try and um, res- I, I try to understand that my dog who has that toy might not want to share that toy. And if another dog is coming into their space and trying to take that toy, I will usually redirect that dog who's trying to take their toy because that's inappropriate. And they may be growling because they might be saying, I really don't want you to take my toy. And this is rude behavior, which it is rude behavior. However, if that dog is growling or guarding toys that are not currently within their possession or that are actually in the other dog's possession, then that is a different kind of problem. And that's one where we need to stop the dog that's growling, right? Either way, um, what you want to do is if those dogs have a really good relationship outside of toy play, um, pick up the toys whenever they're around each other. It's like the simplest management solution. And then you can work on um, practicing uh, one dog having a toy and then the other one getting a treat for not bothering and then swap that so that they learn to be around each other with toys, but they don't need to interact with the toys. Great. Thank you. I know I, uh, my own dogs do that sometimes. So I appreciate that. And thank you all for your questions. Uh, Before we wrap things up, I'd like to extend an invitation to some of our upcoming in-space programs. On Saturday, March 26th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., guests can join us for our Pet Space Give Back Hours. Participants can stop by and help us create essential items for animals at local shelters. This month, we'll be making elevated cat beds. Um, Also, spring break is just around the corner. If you have any young animal lovers looking for a fun and educational activity during school break, check out our upcoming Pet Space Kids Camp sessions. Limited spots are still available for our Pet Pioneer session starting April 4th and our Critter Camp session, which kicks off April 11th. 
And also for any of you that are working on the 10 skills of the American Kennel Club's uh, Canine Good Citizen program, we're offering the AKC's Canine Good Citizen evaluation on April 10th, conducted by our very own Katie McGuire. And also, if any of you are looking to continue your dog's training journey, we regularly host Mutt Manners training and agility uh, classes for a variety of skill levels, also with Katie McGuire. And you can find more information and register for all of these programs at annenbergpetspace.org. Thank you again to Katie for taking the time to share all this great information with us. And also thank you to all of our viewers for joining us this afternoon and continuing to support Wallace Annenberg Pet Space. Have a great rest of your day.